Cool. Good day, Miles. How are you? How are you? I'm good. You can see me and I can see you. I can you can hear me? Yes, yep. we can. Loud and clear. Yes. Well, it's very good. Yeah. This technology doesn't always work, so I'm very glad that it is. You don't got to tell us, man, technical difficulties. That's our middle name over here. <laughs> it, it really it really is. But uh, let's get right into the book here. Uh, we, of course, are talking with uh, Miles A. Copeland III. The new book is called Two Steps Forward, One Step Back, My Life in the Music Business. And uh, Miles, I have to say, I have got a million and one questions because you have touched my life in so many different ways whether it's with IRS records and Black Sabbath, whether it's the police, whether it's uh, the go-go's, uh, you've had a part in, in, in all of it, even squeeze for crying out loud. You're, you're a man of a, of a million talents. Uh, so first of all, welcome to the show. Well, I'm very sorry to have you probably screwed up your life so much. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, 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 made, you made it great. But uh, the, well, the one thing I, I noticed in your book here, and you say it right at the front, you say, I'm not going to write a, a tell-all book on, on how to make it in the music business. You, you talk about your successes and your failures. So what was sort of the, the concept moving forward and, and finally saying, all right, I've got a great story to tell. So here it is. Well, I, I originally didn't like the idea of an autobiography because it, it sort of smacked of, you know, ego and it's like this is what I did and aren't I great you know so I thought I would much prefer to write a book that was motivational uh you know could, people could learn from and I also was thinking of you know my sons they don't particularly like the music the, of my generation for instance they're into their own thing and so I'm thinking well if it's going to be interesting for them it should have some sort of universal truths to it so that I, I did think that in the beginning and then Somebody said to me, well, you know, that's all very well and good, but there's more to it than that. You should also include your, your, the story of, you know, going, growing up in the Middle East and all that. Right. So when the, when the, you know, the lockdown happened and I'm sitting at home bored out of my mind, I decided, well, okay, I'll just start writing. So before I knew it, you know, a couple of months later go by and I've written, I've written the book, you know, and uh, I did incorporate a lot of the lessons I learned, um, and, uh, you know, hopefully people read the book, whether they're in the music business or they're starting a restaurant or some other business will learn from it as well. So I think I kept some of the sort of motivational marketing ideas intact, but I also, you know, we're, we're, was telling the story that I figured people would find interesting, you know, so, you know, did I mention my father in the CIA and yeah. Lebanon and Egypt and Syria? Yeah, okay. Um, growing up in the Middle East and did it affect me and then you know the police thing the punk rock things and all that but out of all of that you know I think in life you learn things and you pass them on and, and the title in a way sort of says that because uh, the, the point is two steps forward one step back is really that you know you're going to move forward you're going to have successes but every now and then you're going to have a failure and that's your step back and that's part of the game, you know? So you have to accept the failures and learn from them just as you do the successes. And I would admit that sometimes the failures were a little more of a, they were, they were greater lessons than were the successes. They were. So in fact, let me start with that. Uh, I do want to talk about your dad and the CIA because that, that to me is completely fascinating. And, and every time I watch a TV show or a movie, it, it's, it's one of those action adventure things with CIA and FBI all over it. But your, your, your big failure, the one that sort of changed the course of history was Starstrucking 75 with Wishbone Ash. Now, what I find interesting from the, a musicologist perspective is it sort of was one of the first touring packages or touring festivals in a sense, uh, but it failed miserably, part of it because of Lou Reed. What was the concept behind that one? And, and what did it fail, what, it, what did its ultimate failure teach you well it was really an attempt you know i had i wish bone ash the climax blues band renaissance they were all bands that were very good performers but were they ever going to write that hit single that would go to number one right. and i sort of recognized the fact that that's probably unlikely so they were going to make it the traditional way you know playing in front of audience and building it slowly building and building and building and i figured i could speed up the process if i could put them on a show with other big names that would attract more people so that instead of playing to 2,000 people, they're, they're playing to 20,000 people. 
So I booked, you know, other acts and I figured, well, I'll create this, I'll link all these festivals together in Europe and add a few of my own and that'll project Wishbone and Climax and all these bands into a bigger situation. Well, what I didn't realize is that this was a much bigger enterprise than I could really handle myself. And, uh, you know, pretty soon you start having mistakes happen. And of course, those mistakes cost you money. And eventually they ate up all the money. So that the thing fell apart, not because it was a bad idea. It fell apart because we just ran out of money, you know. Right. When And things like Lou Reed, you know, when he was supposed to do the last bunch of shows and we, we, we couldn't find him, you know. And so I finally managed to get his hotel room in, in uh, it's, it's either Australia or New Zealand. New Zealand, and, according and, to the book. Yeah, New Zealand. <laughs> it was New Zealand. So I get I get put through to his room and I was his assistant answered it and said, well, uh, I said, can I speak to Lou Reed? I, I need to know his travel plans because he's supposed to be in the country, you know, on, on tour. And, and they said, well, we know nothing about the tour. We left that agency. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, well, let me talk to Lou, you know. Well, he's in the bathroom. And I said, well, I'll wait. And they said, well, uh, might be a long wait. And I said, well, what are you talking about? She, you know, and I was told that he had been in the bathroom for a couple of days already, and they had no idea when he was coming out. So that sort of told me right there, you know, I'm in deep trouble here. So needless to say, Lou never showed up. We had to hire I can see a Turner who right. delivered a brilliant show. But the reality was that it cost us an arm and a leg and I ran out of money. And so that that tour was a was a creative success. You know, as Wishbone attests to now, they, they, they I spoke to Andy Powell, the guitar player, who yep. said, you know what, that that tour really did help us break Europe. But for me, it bank it, it almost bankrupted me. Yeah, and well, in fact, you just mentioned the words "break Europe." Uh, let me fast forward here to to the other bands, the Police, and so on. Uh, how important was it to break the American market? Because you know, I know Wishbone Nash, and I've heard of them, and and Mahavishu Orchestra, but they didn't really break in North America. Um, how was how important was it to break bands over here? Well, I, the the reality is that you know people imagine around the world i mean things have changed maybe lately you know but people have always imagined that rock and roll was really founded in the united states whether it be new orleans or chicago or whatever so rock and roll was always something where it was sort of looked upon as as an american institution you know even the beatles sang songs that were written by chuck berry and they wanted you know they going to america you know they would they would buy records that were released in america you know and those were imports into England, you know. The British would try to compete. You know, they had, they had Cliff Richard, who was their, their version of Elvis Presley. Well, he never succeeded in America, you know. But the Beatles did. And when they did, yeah. breaking America was like, all of a sudden, they were gods, you know. And I think for Australian bands or for, for bands all around the world, if you can break America, you can, you know, like, like the old song, you know, if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. Is if you can make it in America, you could make it anywhere. And that America always had this mystique. So if you could if you could break America, that would open doors to people to pay attention to you, you know. And I'm when I managed Zuccaro, you know, the big Italian artist, he was huge in Italy, but he knew that being accepted in America would make him even bigger in Italy, you know. And I think you know the reason the Beatles were so big in England was because they broke America, you know. Um, and the same goes for a lot of the British bands. Breaking America is like, you know, climbing Mount Everest. Yeah, and a lot of the bands that, that, that I love that are still huge in the UK, whether it's Status Quo or Thunder, for some reason, they never were able to have a valid American plan. And so they're just these regional bands, in a sense. Um, let me just quickly get, I'm going to sort of go all over the place because we our time is well, limited. I can tell you why that is, actually. Yeah, okay, yeah, please. Well, if it, the thing about England is it, it's a relatively small country. You can get played by the BBC radio and you're reaching the entire country. You can be famous in London and that's the whole country. Whereas in America, you come to America, you can be big in New York and nobody's ever heard of you in California. Right. You've got to break state by state, city by city. You know, there's no such, there was no such thing, particularly in the earlier days, there's no such thing as national radio. 
you know. So you you could break New York radio, but you know, you get to Chicago and you're you're just nobody, you know. So a band that you know could could go and sell out, you know, a three or four or five or ten thousand seat venue in, in in England and do it all over the country would go to America and find themselves playing in a club and say, hell, the hell with this. We're going back to England, you know. Yeah. So I think that was the case of a lot of bands. They they realized that breaking America was a, was a real slog. It was hard work. You, you got to put time in, you know, over and over and over again. You know, you got to play every dump there is. You know, like like uh, Pete Townsend and Roger Daltrey told Wishbone Ash on the I think it was the second tour. They said, look, the way you break America is you play and you play and you play every dive there is. You keep playing and eventually you get to be big. You know, well, most bands really don't want to go through that. They'd rather be big day one, you know, yeah. which you can do in England. Yeah. And it's kind of like that now today, you know, looking at social media and the way that kind of younger artists portray themselves online. It's like, you know, you get one hit song through TikTok or YouTube and then all of a sudden you're selling on MSG with like with a barely an EP out. It's 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 such a different world now. Was that a big part of like the police success? Like, you know, they kind of started out as like a punk band and kind of what was it like making the transition there? Well, the police remember, let, let, let's if you look at the band itself, OK, Stewart had been in Curved Air, which was, you know, a classical, a classic progressive rock band. Sting mm -hmm. was a jazz player in a group called Last Exit. And Summers was in Soft Machine. And there is no band more progressive than that, you know. So you could you would have a hard time saying they were traditional punks, you know. They mm. were older, they were wiser, they could play more than three chords, you know. But what excited Stewart particularly was that the punk rock um, phenomena was it wasn't so much about your musicianship and your you know it was the energy of it. It was the anti-establishment vibe. It was breaking with the rules it was doing it your own way that was what was exciting about it you know mm. some of the bands really couldn't play very well well did it matter well it didn't really matter you know in the case of the police they could play you know but what excited them was was the fact that you were basically thumbing your nose at the establishment and the police were very much into that so mm. the transition really wasn't that great coming to america because you know america was still interested in whether you could play your instruments or not but they were kind of caught up in the idea of this of anti-establishment as well. But the police could actually play. So could Squeeze. And so those bands were accepted, you know. And if you look at the, you know, the history of music in America, the bands that actually could play, whether it be Talking Heads or the B-52s or whatever, you know, they could they could actually play their instruments, you know. And so they, they succeeded. Mm. Yeah, very much so. Um, before I move on with the more police questions, uh, or I just, let me start here with the with the geek question. You had Henry Pendavani as the guitarist in the police. Uh, it's become sort of a footnote in history. In fact, it is a footnote in history. What was the story behind him being the first guitarist? You put out a single, and then all of a sudden, six months later, out he goes. What was the story there? Well... It's, it, this would be a question you could ask Stuart, okay. because Stuart, in the, in the vibe of look, let's form a punk group. He needed a, he needed a band that looked like a punk group, okay. Hmm. And he saw Henry, and Henry looked like a punk. He would, you know, when he, when he cut his hair and he he shaved, he could look like a punk. He looked, you know, Henry was one of these guys that you know he could look angry even when he wasn't, you know. So Stuart really hired Henry not because he was a great musician, but because he looked right. He fit the kind of image that he imagined punk would be. Well, later on, when you know Andy Summers joined and he could play a lot of chords, and Sting could say, "Hey, you know what? Some of my songs can actually be played now because the guitar player can play them." Do we really need Henry? You know, and so Henry, not being a great player at that time, found himself really superfluous. Okay, well, as it happened. Henry later became quite a good player. Yeah. And uh, he actually ended up as a huge star in France because he was one of the three judges on the X Factor, the French X Factor, which was the number one TV show in France. So Henry, got, having left the police, you know, ended up as a national icon in France, you know, and getting <laughs> marriage proposals in the mail, you know. 
Oh, that's, that's funny. Crazy. He's the Simon Cowell of, of uh, France. Now, yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we mentioned Star Trucking uh, 75 as being sort of the, the point where it all crumbles and you sort of rebuild and do the punk thing. But then you mention in the, in the book as well, Shea Stadium and the police playing Shea Stadium being sort of the apex of, of the whole thing. Um, knowing that it's symbolic with the Beatles having played there, how important was that in your career and in their career to finally say, hey, you know what? The Beatles did it. Now we're doing it. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's a funny thing because my, the publisher suggested that I open the book with Shea Stadium because yeah. in people's mind, that's like a big deal, right? Yeah. But when people have asked me, what's the most important show you ever did with the police? My answer was always, well, it was a show in Northern New York to four people. And they go, what? But At the Shea Stadium, 80,000 people going, you know, wasn't that the, and I said, no, no. It was the four people, at one of whom happened to be this minor DJ at a station in Boston called MIT University. His name was Oedipus. Right. And he was and when the police walked out on stage, there were four people there who had bought tickets. Here they were, this unknown group on their first tour of America. Nobody had ever heard of them. They only had a single, uh, which was the import. And they said, well, four people bought tickets. Let's give them a hell of a show. And they went out there and they killed. And Oedipus was so enamored with the group, yeah. he went back to Boston and started playing that record on his radio show over and over again until it became a regional hit. And that's when it percolated and got into Billboard. And Jerry Moss at AM Records had seen it and said, then called me up and said, You know, I see AM Records next to Police. Is that our band? And I said, Yeah, it is. And he said, Well, you better get him back over here. Let's, let's work the record. And that started the police going. So it was that small little moment. Wow. And I tell the story in the book because it, it yeah. really is a great lesson and that you can't necessarily, you know, be too proud about playing in front of a few people because it might be there's one person in that audience who can change your life. And that effectively is what happened. Yeah. Well, you know, they always Oedipus say. literally changed the life of the police and me and whatever else. If he hadn't been there, who knows? Maybe the police would never would have happened. Right. And, and they always say you got to play for the people who show up, not the people that don't show up. Yeah. Um, speaking of small clubs, uh, I was born and raised in Montreal and I'm still here. You, you come to the Olympic Stadium in 1983, but the night before you play at the small spectrum in Montreal for about 700 people. Uh, that still affects me because I, I just thought, wow, that's really cool that they're going to do the Olympic Stadium. But before that, they're going to play this club. Uh, what was it about Montreal and, and the band's connection to the city where you would do special things like that for the city? And and how important was that that Spectrum show to, to just get in there and sort of sweat it out in a small venue before playing the Olympic Stadium? Well, I think I think the reason for that, and we also did the same in London. We played the Marquee Club yep. and then we went and played Wembley Arena. And we did it in quite a few places because it's very easy to forget your roots, Yep. to forget the people that helped you on the way up. And I remember Sting saying to me one day, he said, you know, don't ever forget the people on the way up because you may need them on the way down, you know? And it's so true. So we would play the small club to help the promoter out, let's just say, who gave us a shot in the beginning when we were nobody. So to be able to say to him, look, we're going to give you a show uh, was a great thing for that promoter, you know? But it also kept us true to our roots that we were not so proud that we wouldn't play for the you know, we were now big stars. We were only going to play in big venues. We can play in small ones too. And that really was the rationale of the police. And I think, you know, the whole sort of punk movement was, you know, don't forget your roots. And I think that's, that's kind of important. And it, it, it's very easy to forget your roots really, you know, and we tried in the case of the police not to, and that's why we played, you know, smaller clubs in a lot of the cities. Yeah. And, and what, what a great show. Um, I want to move on over to uh, IRS records. Uh, you've got the success with the police, you've got the success with Squeeze, and, and you say, all right, I'm going to set up this label. What was sort of the, the thought process behind having your own label rather than bringing these bands to Warner or bringing them to Universal and saying, no, I'm going to have my own imprint? Well, first place, I had a lot of bands in England. I started in England with, with the sort of punk rock labels, and we signed also to these the crazy groups and i knew a lot of these groups would probably not appeal to the ears of the 
traditional record company. I mean, Jerry Moss, if I had played in the music, he probably would have laughed at me. You know, he understood the police and squeeze, but was he going to understand Chelsea or the Buzzcocks or the Cramps? Probably not. Okay. So I figured, well, you know, a lot of these records I've already recorded, and I know a lot of the British groups can't get deals in America right. because the record industry is turning their nose up. So they'll probably make very cheap deals, which I might be able to afford. So I thought, well, I'm going to go to Jerry Moss and make him a deal, he, you know, make him an offer he can't refuse. So I went into him and I said, look, Jerry, I've got these records in, in, in England that I'd like to release. And uh, I've got bands there that would like to you know, have their records put out in America. So I'm going to make you a deal. I don't need your money. I'll finance making the record and putting the, getting the records and all that. All I need you to do is to put the records out and have your salespeople tell you what they think they can sell. So you're really, there's no risk. So he said, well, okay, let's do it. Let me hear the records. I said, aha, that's the one caveat. You can't hear the music, but you have to put out every record I give you. Wow. And I guess he, he, he must have thought, well, what the hell? You know, I mean, Miles seems to have some finger on the pulse here. They're, I guess the police and squeeze are doing okay. So how bad could it be? My salespeople, they don't think they can sell anything. They won't press up their records. So he said, yes. Yeah, And lo and behold, I then put out Chelsea and Fashion and the Buzzcocks and the Cramps and, yep. you know, Oingo Boingo and these bands that couldn't get arrested in America, you know. Mm. And at the end of the first year, Jerry Moss calls me into his office and says, well, you know, you haven't had a, you haven't had a hit record because to him, a hit record is, you know, top 30 or something, you know. Right. And uh, I had to sit there and convince him that, um, you know, what we're doing is actually successful because we've only had one record out from each act and everyone has actually made, you actually made money in the first year. Yeah. And he had to say, well, yeah, but I didn't make very much. And I said, yeah, but when in your career have you ever made money on anything you ever signed the year one? Right. And he said, well, never. And I said, well, you made money with me, even yeah. though it was a piddling amount. And he said, okay, I'll give you another year. And then we signed the Go-Go's and of course they didn't happen actually in the second year, but they looked like they might be on the way. And, and by the, by the third year, the Go-Go's went to number one. And by that point, yeah. everybody kind of woke up and said, oops, this IRS thing is not so crazy after all. They got a number one record. Yeah. So uh, wow. I, I do want to talk about the Go-Go's, but I, I want to get over to Black Sabbath because you, you signed them for Headless Cross. And at the time there's no Aussie. There's no Ronnie James Dio. The previous album with Glenn Hughes sort of kind of, you know, disappeared. Uh, what attracted you to, to bringing in Tony without Ozzy and without Ronnie and saying, all right, let's do this. Go get Tony. Let's do this. Well, Tony Iommi was always part of the sound of Black Sabbath. So he was, right. you know, you know, it would have been Ozzy and Tony, basically. They were, they were the, 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 the magic people, you know. But that was at a time when IRS was really now beginning to face the fact that we were we had challenges from other record companies. Everybody knew that we were, you know, that, that there there is there is money in them their heels, you know. Uh, and we were we had rent to pay, you know. I had staff to pay. I had, you know, when I started IRS Records, there was just two or three of us, you know, then five, and then six, and then at eight, you know. By this point, we had you know sixty people or something, you know. I had offices. I had rent to pay. I had taxes. So you had to start thinking about signing acts that you thought could sell something. And so Black Sabbath were a name that was known. And we figured, well, we could sell some of those. And we kind of liked what Tony was doing and figured well, he still had something to say. And so you find yourself giving more latitude to product that maybe you wouldn't have signed back in the early days of IRS. Right. But now you're faced with the fact that you need to sell records to pay the rent. You know, right. So you have to make some decisions that, you know, Maybe you, you, we're not what you would have done, you know, back in 1978 or nine. Right. And, and brand always trumps band anyway. And uh, I'll, I'll hit you with one more Black Sabbath question before I move on. Uh, you eventually get to Dehumanizer and they bring back Ronnie James Dio. How integral was the label or you or, or management into making that happen? And, and was the album eventually successful enough for you to consider it a success? Well, success for me was, did it make money? Did it help me pay the rent? Right. Okay. So if it didn't go to number one, to me, that wasn't a problem. But I will I will admit that a lot of those bands, including Tony Iommi and whatever, 
they it was very hard for them to accept the fact that they were now older and they were not going to have a number one record. So if it wasn't, you know, top 10, Tony would have been disappointed, you know, top 100. I was happy with, but he wouldn't have been. And that was one of the problems of signing older artists is that they, they, it was very difficult for them to get their heads around the fact that, you know, they were older, not likely to have hit records. And, you know, I, I came across this when I put Sting on with the, with, with the Grateful Dead. The Grateful Dead accepted the fact that they were never going to have a hit record again because they'd put out so many. I remember Jerry Garcia saying to me, you know, Miles, who's going to buy record 20, you know, 24 of the Grateful Dead? You know, look, if we sold 100,000 records of a new release, that's a good day for us. But if they could sell out 60,000 seats and Which have a can. huge merchandising business, that was great. You know, so they recognized they were older. Their audience was different. There were the, the, you know, thinking about the album and having a hit single was no longer the game, you know. So, uh, but I did think that in case of, you know, whether it be Tony Omi and some of the bands we signed, that, you know, they had their ideas that they wanted to be back in the charts and having the number 10 record again or number nine or number one again, you know. But those were really not very real, even for Sting, you know. You know, once he was over 50, is he ever going to have a number one single or a number one album again? Well, probably not. Uh, one more thing about records that uh, to stay on the Montreal thing here is the police and Sting came over and recorded at Le Studio in Morin Heights quite often. And of course, Morin Heights has now fallen apart and it's bankrupt and the whole thing. Well, the place burnt down a couple of years ago. It was like it was yeah, a, after it was being vandalized, the, the whole thing. <laughs> What brought the police to Le Studio? What was it about that studio that it was, it was the premier studio at the time? You know, it wasn't in Nashville. It wasn't in L.A. It was in the woods of northern Quebec. What, what was it about Le Studio that was so appealing to the band? Well, there, there you know, I, I would answer that several ways. Number one, it was a very good studio and it had a good reputation. OK, so from a musical standpoint, it had the, the chops, let's say. But Canada was more attractive tax-wise than America or mm. England. So there were, there were reasons why when you're successful that it doesn't make a lot of sense to, to, to play in a place where you're gonna all of a sudden trigger big tax problems, okay? So that was a reality, you know? That's why some of the bands recorded it in France or we recorded it in Montserrat or we, you know, you would look for places that were necessary, you know, that would give you more latitude to be able to you know, deal with the financial side of stuff. Because the reality is the bigger you get, finances do play a role. So you have to think about things like that, you know. Mm. So I think, um, you know, I can't remember all the rationale of why that studio was chosen, but I, I, re I know that from the standpoint of the band, they were more concerned with making sure their music was good and the studio could deliver the sounds they wanted. But from my standpoint, you know, I, I, I would have to think about things like, well, is there some tax advantage or, or you know, they, are we going to get a good price there? The deals, the deals in Canada were better than you could make in Nashville, for instance, or Los Angeles. Uh, and uh, that made it quite an att attractive place to be. And we, we, we quite liked the city. Yeah. I mean, Warren Heights was, was quite... My, quite my a... son, Aislinn, by the way, went, went to McGill University and oh. loves, loves Montreal. You know, he, he went there for four years. Now oh, he's wow. in Germany at the... You know, but uh, he, he attended McGill University, oh, my mom, which uh, was a lot cheaper than all the American universities. Yeah, for, what a foreign, and very good. Listen, my mom has been at McGill since 1962. She still teaches. So, yeah. you know, it's a great it's a great university. Uh, before I forget the uh, the father being a CIA agent, you know, the, so for those of us that aren't in the CIA, we have this glamorized sort of thing about intrigue and mystique, and, <laughs> and, and we see what we see on the Hollywood movies. But what was the reality of growing up in a home like that? Because you had to move. You had to go to the Middle East. You had to move here. You had to move there. What was that like, that experience? And, and what do you learn from it? Well, I, I would say two things. Number one is, you know, when you're in America, you're just an American like everybody else, Okay. So you're, you're conscious of being an American is maybe different, but when you go overseas, you're looked upon, oh, you're an American. So you, you become more conscious of the fact that you're an American. Um, 
so I would say that, and, and of course, most of the Americans you see overseas are not, you know, hobos and, and, and homeless people, because, you know, to, to get a job overseas, you probably are, you know, you're, you're probably middle class or you're working for the, you know, the agency or you're working for college, or whatever. So you're, you know, you're probably have some money. So everybody imagines an American overseas being somebody that's rich mm. compared to the local people you probably are. You come back to America and, you know, there are poor people and there are rich people and, you know, everything in between, you know, so there's that difference. I'd go overseas and I would be, you know, in a smaller community and be welcomed quickly because you know, there's very few of you. We come back to America, you're coming back to school and you're, you're interfacing with people who've grown up together and you're some new boy coming in from the outside. So getting adjustment coming to America was a little bit of an issue, you know. So I, I would grow up, I would be quite shy when I was in America and I'd go overseas and you'd sort of blossom again, you know. Um, and that was probably my upbringing. But I, I think I became more conscious of what it was like to be an American by, by the experience of living overseas than if I had just grown up in America. Hmm. It, it, it's just a fascinating read. Um, and then uh, finally here, how, how do you see artist development change uh, in our context now because back then like you said you play you play you play and you just play some more uh, is that still the same formula to have success i mean could you create another police in terms of successful bands now well, you know I, I i i've had bands you know over the years you know i'll have some bands say man it's about the music you know it's all about the music and i'd say excuse me no it's not Right. OK, it's not about the music. Number one, it's about knowing you exist, because if people don't know you exist, they're never going to hear your music. So job number one is how do you get attention? How do you get to be known? How do you get people to hear you? Then it's about the music. So it's about the music, man, is number two. But that lesson is still the same today. Now, maybe back in, in you know the 60s you did it by playing shows or you know getting on radio and and you know playing every dive in america you know um today it might be the internet it might be you know tiktok or whatever but it's still the same thing how do you get attention and that leads mm -hmm. us to you know imagery you know why does lady gaga wear wild clothes you know look at the elton john movie it starts with him in rehab if it bleeds, it leads. The more outrageous, the more shocking, the more crazy it is, the more it's attention getting. The Sex Pistols was all about getting attention. Malcolm McLaren was brilliant at getting press. He didn't give a damn about the band playing. Right. He was not about he was not about making records. He was about getting press attention. Okay. The band were about playing. They liked the idea of playing. You know. Um, you know, Donald Trump is about getting on TV. How did he get elected? He got in the newspaper. He sucked out the attention. So you, you, I look at Donald Trump and I say, that's a marketing strategy. Mm -hmm. Okay. So really, I say things have not changed. They've changed in the distribution of music. Right. But yeah. they've not changed in the first challenge, which is how do I get attention? Right. And I think that is now you've got different ways to get attention, but it's still... The job is how do I get that? Do I wear funny clothes? Do I dye my hair blue? Do I do it Billy Eilish? I turn it green? Do I, you know, yeah. say wacky things? Do I say crazy stuff that gets me elected president? I mean, you know, but it's getting attention. That's what it's all about. Yeah. Talking about getting attention, you know, it's it's funny you, you said, you know, times have changed, obviously. I, and I've always been really curious about this. And you're the per you're like the perfect person to ask this. You look at a concert ticket price these days and Say 1987, a concert ticket was 1550, but now that same concert ticket is like 300 dollars for a seat on the floor. How did you guys make money back in the day? Well, you know, back then, you know, you I I bought my first Jaguar, brand new Jaguar. Okay, it cost me 2,500 pounds. Jeez, wow. okay. <laughs> that was back in 1970 something. Okay. If I wanted to buy that same new car today, it was what sixty or seventy thousand dollars. Okay, so yeah. you know things change. When I first got to England in 1969, the average salary was fifteen pounds a week. I bought my first suit on Carnaby Street for sixteen pounds. 
mm. which is about, you know, twenty dollars. You know, um, but in today's money, that would be maybe three hundred. You know, but the the reality is that you know things have gotten more expensive. But there is something else that that's gone on. You know, and that is the exclusivity. Uh, last year, For Ferrari announced that they were cutting the production of Ferrari cars in half, and they were doubling the price. Mm. And the idea was. Okay, they were selling cars for $250,000. They increased the price to $500,000. They cut the production in half and raised the, you know, raised the price to make it more exclusive because yeah. they were selling exclusivity. So people will now, why will people pay crazy numbers for tennis shoes? I mean, I've seen tennis shoes that are selling for $30,000. Who would have ever thought? I mean, to me, yeah. a tennis shoe is, you know, it's 15 bucks, you know. Yeah. You know, you look at you look at, you know, the Kelly bag or some of these other, you know, fashion items or there's somebody there was a robbery in California a couple of days ago and somebody ran into a restaurant and grabbed some guy's watch and ran out with it. That watch was worth five hundred thousand dollars. Who would wear a watch wearing five? What? I mean, that is just nuts to me. You know, yeah. I mean, to me, I would. Hell, I got a watch on my iPhone. Who needs to watch? You know, why would I spend five hundred thousand dollars on a watch? You know, but there is an element of exclusivity, yeah. mm -hmm. and that's that's part of the mystique of some of the things that are out there. That's like you know, baseball games, football games, whatever. You know, people will pay money. You know, the the uh, the funny thing was is that I I in nowadays there's a there's a thing in rock and roll where there's there there is extra you pay extra to get a VIP pass. Yeah, which means yeah. you get to sit at the front row. Then you go backstage and you meet the band, and you sell. You know, the, your average ticket might be fifty bucks, but the VIP ticket is two hundred and fifty bucks. But you get these extra things. Mm -hmm. Well, a couple of years ago, I went to see the um, manager of uh, Kiss, and I was saying, Talk "Well, you know, McGee. it's really this wild that uh, you know people will pay that money for you know to go meet the band and all that." He says, "Well, hey, don't tell anybody, but we do something else too." You know, and uh, that's why I love Gene Simmons. This guy is about making money. You know, he he's no yeah. <laughs> he's no qualms about it. Just if there's money there, he'll take it. So, yeah. What the what kids do is that after they they sell the VIP tickets and they've left the building and they've gone, you can buy a ticket to go backstage to see where Kiss was, and that's an extra amount of money. And I said, wait a minute, you mean people will pay to go backstage to see like? A sandwich, and they, oh yeah, that that's that's the sandwich that uh, G Gene Simmons only ate half of. Uh, people will pay for that. Well, yeah, they will. It's actually we make money on tour doing that. So people will pay for the damnedest things, you know. Yeah. So if there's a market for it, you might as well charge for it. Yeah. Well, nowadays it seems like you can do it, you know, and Kiss definitely do. Yeah. Yeah. They're they're they're, they're actually really great at that. In fact, I. Actually, just, I just bought a Kiss CD today, come to think of it. So there you go. Can't see it on the green screen, but there you go. Yeah. Uh, Miles, this, is, this has been fantastic. Um, let me end on this then. The, the police in 83 were on top of the world. Um, when Sting eventually comes to you and say, you know what? I, I want to do a few solo albums. I want to. What was that like for you? Did, did you sort of see, well, the police is over. That's the end of everything. Or was there always a hope that, you'd get them going again and you'd, you'd get them to continue because they were on top of the world. They, they were the world. I mean, every breath you take that whole album synchronicity was, was it? Um, well, to be honest, I don't think any of us maybe sting, but uh, certainly not Stuart, Andy or I, we didn't want to admit to anyone that the police was over. Right. Did I secretly think that if sting goes solo and has a big success solo wise, that maybe he might not think he has to do the police. Well, you know, did it cross my mind? Yeah. Did I want to admit it to myself? No. And I think we we avoided saying the police had broken up for a long time. And uh, I think it was partly out of the fact that we did hope that they would get back together again. But I knew that once Sting, you know, but Sting wanted me to handle his solo career, which I did for the next five albums. Yep. And, uh, you know, so I, I was continuing to make money. Was I continuing to hope that the police would reform and do it again? Well, yeah, but, and that was originally the idea. Sting would do a solo record, so would Stewart, so would Andy, but then they would get back together again. But I think Sting recognized that, you know, he could 
solo wise, he could do exactly what he wanted. He could hire the exact drummer he wanted, the exact, ba- you know, the exact um, keyboard player. He could get musicians he respected doing what they do, you know. And so we'd had Kenny Kirkland or, you know, Branford Marsalis or Vinnie Caliuta and all these great players. Great players. Whereas with the police, you know, he would have to listen to what Andy Summers had to say and what Stewart had to say. He was one of three. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, he would have to adjust to what they their vision was as well. Right. Whereas in his solo band, he wouldn't have to do that. And I think that had to be attractive to him. And I think really when he went solo, that enabled him to to do his i mean he used to say to me my songs are my babies this meant that he could rear his babies the exact way he wanted them to be without having to consider anybody else would i advise him here and there yeah but um basically he now had to listen to me every now and then (laughs) and maybe the record company a little bit but he didn't have to listen to Stuart or andy anymore and uh you know did he really listen to his own musicians you know, that he hired, well, I discovered that they were intimidated enough that they didn't offer much advice either. So he, right. he pretty much could rule the roost and do what he wanted to do, you know. Unbelievable. And that was one of the great lessons that I learned during the Sting years was that, you know, a lot of people get intimidated by a star and they figure, well, you know, what can I say to Sting? He writes great songs and he's a great singer and he's a great bass player. Who am I to tell him he should change the song this way, you know? Well, I never thought that way. I would say, I think you should change something, you know, yeah. but um, producers and whatever wouldn't. And oh. um, I think that sometimes was a mistake. I think Sting appreciated the fact that somebody would tell him the truth, you know, which yeah. is why he he always had me as his manager for such a long time. Did, did that create a, a sort of weirdness with Stuart? Did Stuart ever just say, hey, what are you doing? Like, you're managing him. How about us? Well, I was managing Stuart as well, and Andy, right. you know, um, and uh, I mean, I write in the book about Andy. It was yep. One of the sad moments is when I got him a record deal with MCA and he delivered a record, which I don't think was Andy's best effort. I wanted him to go back and work on it some more, you know, because I knew he had more in him. Yep. Mm. And uh, he just didn't want to listen. I mean, he would listen to Sting. He would just didn't want to listen to me. You know, he listened to his friends, basically. Yeah. And frankly i mean the record company was honest with me when i went in there on my own but when i took andy in they were intimidated they didn't want to tell him the truth you know so they told him his record was great i told him it wasn't you know he needed more work so he must have looked upon me as i was an idiot you know and uh, frankly when the record came out the record company didn't work it and it did not it was not a success with Stuart, I worked with him. I helped him get soundtracks. You know, we did Rumblefish. We did other soundtracks. I helped launch that career. Yep. And I would think he and I both secretly, you know, would have liked the police to reform. Would he have been angry at me or slightly? Yeah, to some degree, perhaps. I think probably you know, he did have a resentment. But then again, you know, I got to make a living too, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah, fair is fair. Wanted me to manage him, and I had obligations to all three. And I, as far as I was concerned, I lived up to all three. So I, managed, I lived up to all three. Yeah, and at the end of the day, you can't force anybody to do some that they don't want to do. It's like Sting wants to be Sting. He's going to be Sting. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, I on that on that one album, and I talk about it in the book where I went in a bit late, you know, and he'd already kind of recorded the songs. And I said to him, Sting, these are great songs, but you know. I, I think they're missing it as singles. You know, your, your hook isn't happening when it should happen. Mm. And he said, okay, well, l- let's play the song. You tell me what you think, you know? And I, he played it and I said, well, see? And I would point out where I thought something could happen. He said, yeah, well, I see what you're saying, but I kind of like the way it is. And you know what? If it doesn't work, I'll pay the price. Well, Sting was one of those rare artists. Was when he said he'll pay the price, he meant it. And I didn't get blamed. And the record went out and did not do what it was supposed to do. But I made him agree that next time we'll get somebody in who'll tell you what you need to hear when you're putting the song down. And I made a point myself of going in early so I could make suggestions before the thing had actually been kind of put down and it was on tape, you know. Because when I went to the producer on that album and I suggested, you know, you know, you just heard what I said to Sting, you know, was I right? And he said, yeah, you were right. 
I said, well, didn't you tell him? And he said, well, who am I to tell Sting how to write a song? I said, huh. but isn't that your job? But he was intimidated, you know? <laughs> and I think that's one of the problems of, of the star is that, you know, will people tell them what they, what they should hear? Yeah. yeah. And, and, and the problem is they, it's often the case that they, you know, people are intimidated and will not tell them what they want to hear. Or they'll tell them what they want to hear, not what they should hear. Right. And right. That's, why, yeah. that's why I think when you look back on artists, the first one, two, three, maybe four albums are great because there's been a producer and a manager saying you should do this. And by the time they get to four or five, six, they go, I know what I'm doing. Leave me alone. And you, and yeah. you can sort of see that decline. You go, Meh. yeah, you no, know, uh, I, I think you're right. I think that that happens. And, and the other thing that I've noticed, and people always say, well, you know, when, when you get to be a big star, you change. Well, no, I think what happens is people around you change. All of a yes. sudden, you're yeah. looked upon as somebody that's special. And, you know, you, you find yourself, you, your friends that used to be friends have trouble talking to you because they imagine you're this new person, you know, where you're just the same person, you know. Yeah. I mean, I tell a story in the book, you know, when I, I, I was asked to be a keynote speaker at the New Music Seminar. And I get up and I speak in front of these two or 3,000 people. And I guess everybody thought that I was some sort of, you know, God at that point. You know, I was the, the forefront of the new wave and punk rock and all that. I just thought myself as, you know, a successful rock and roll manager. And I walk off stage and uh, some girl comes running up to me with a tape and hands me the tape. And just as she does, she faints in front of me. And I'm thinking... You know, for my first instinct was I didn't touch her. I didn't, I didn't do anything. And what I realized was, is that here she was presenting the tape to the person she thought could change her life. You know, I was going to be able to wave a wand and make her successful, you right. know, and she just fainted that it, she was so overcome. And at that moment, I realized that people were now seeing me as something different. I wasn't just some rock and roll manager who had a couple of successes. I was this guy that could wave a wand and make you happen or not, you know? And wow. I think that's what happens with a lot of artists. You know, they get to be so big that they think that, well, you know, they can do no wrong. No, I, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, you know, it's true. I got, happens all I got the time. one last question for you before we wrap up. Okay. The, uh, the collaboration with Sting, Rod Stewart and Brian Adams from the Three Musketeers soundtrack, All for Love. There's not a lot of information about how that collaboration happened. Did, were you around at that time? And how did, how did you have any stories about that? Well, you know, it was one of these things where you figure, look, the movie company wanted to have this hit song and they figured, you know, if we put three stars in, it's going to be, you know, that's, that's a slam dunk basically, you know? Mm. So it was sort of a commercial decision-making, you know, did, where we creatively think, I mean, we had toured with Brian Adams before and I always liked him, you know, yeah. and I liked his manager, you know, and, you know, but was was that a marriage made in heaven? Was that something that everybody related to everybody else? Well, no, it was more of a, well, it sounds like it could be a hit. You put those three people together and it's going to be a hit, you know. Yeah. And I think it was more of a commercial idea than it was a creative idea. Whereas in the case of Desert Rose, putting Shep Mommy with Sting, that was a very much a creative idea. You know, Shep Mommy had that perfect voice for the idea that Sting had. And that was like, well, let's get the perfect guy to fill this particular job. Mm. And that was a creative decision. Whereas, you know, Brian and Rod, they were, that was really sort of a commercial decision. Yeah. Cause Brian, you know, he wrote the song with Mott Lang and it was kind of like what they did uh, for the Robin Hood thing where they just kind of wrote to the score of the song. And I guess, yeah, the studio was like, well, let's get Rod Stewart and sing and it'll be a hit. Huh? Yeah. Well, I think, I think, you know, that, that tends to happen. I mean, you know, when Disney called up and said, we want Sting to do the soundtrack to our next animated feature. Well, they were, they were looking for a big star. And of course now it was Sting's turn, you know? Mm. So I think that's what happens. You know, a lot of products are figuring, well, you know, the bigger name we can get to promote it, the more attention we're going to get. And it's again, the job of getting attention. So yeah. if the job is to get attention, their idea was to sell the movie. The song would help them sell the movie. Right. I, I guess did. that's why, you know, you look at 007 now. They got Billie Eilish when they could have got any artist. You know, the, the most recent James Bond movie. They go with the most modern pop star around. It's like, okay, well, I guess they want a younger fan base. Yeah, always do. Yeah. I mean, you know, they're not going to go choose somebody that's unknown because, you know, yeah. the other thing is you've got these executives in there who want to be heroes. So do they want to call some unknown person that is their friend from down the street that they think is great? 
No, they're going to call the biggest star they can get because their boss is going to say, oh, wow, you got Billie Eilish? Fantastic, you know. Yeah. Whereas I, I got Joe Blow from the Schmoes. Who? Yeah, Joe like, Blow and the Schmoes. Yeah, <laughs> you got, and, and you that happen. They're going to look at you like you're a schmuck. Yeah, they throw yeah. you right out of there. Uh, two steps forward, one step back. My life in the music business. Uh, Miles A. Copeland III. Uh, um, book comes out in July. Thank you. Absolute pleasure. Uh, uh, nice talking to you. If you remember some more questions, feel free. Let me know. We'll, we'll talk some more. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I, I got tons of questions. I mean, I, I only got uh, I only got through the first like twenty chapters. So there's ten more chapters. So ten more chapters of questions. But this this was great and. Uh, Hey, well, uh, call me back next month and we'll talk some more. Absolutely. Thank Perfect. you, sir. Have a good day. All right, take care. Cheers now. Bye-bye. See you later. Bye.